Muslim in Trauma. Uh, it's an international community. It's people all over the world doing this type of work. Uh, so in terms of the question that Dylan, you were raising with Oregon, one thing that I would think about is connecting with folks in the dark community, both within the United States, who are in smaller newsrooms and have dealt with other types of mass shootings. And sadly, there's more and more of those types of organizations. And then also thinking about connecting with organizations overseas. So like the Australian Broadcasting Corporation has made a real comprehensive commitment to have its reporters not be exposed to too much trauma, to be able to talk about what happens when things come up, and to uh, alternate their assignments from really being on the front lines and then having a little bit of variety. So that may not be, I don't know a lot of you guys are smaller outfits, but just being able to talk not just nationally as folks who are doing similar stuff, but internationally, I think that could be a real source of support. I also wanted to mention uh, Dr. Frank Ockford, uh, who uh, Dylan and I, we, we were at a house event in 2011. He's really, he's a psychiatrist whose work led to uh, the, the phrase the Stockholm Syndrome. He was one of the founders of the term PTSD uh, with a number of other psychiatrists. And over the past 15 years, he's really been a pioneer of trying to bring together journalists and people who do mental health services. And so he can really be someone very helpful to talk with on a strategic level as a manager, on an individual level as a journalist. And he's also worked with an organization called Gift From Within. And I've, I've sent all these links to Dylan so we can share them with everybody. But Gift From Within is an organization that specifically looks at some veterans issues, but also has a lot of material from Frank talking about some of these, these types of issues. So I know we want to have a conversation, so I'll, I'll stop there for now. Uh, but definitely there are some things in terms of the, the immediate aftermath of a really devastating attack, and then you know, several weeks out, and then two months out, there's kind of a cycle, sadly, that often these uh, issues play out on, and so there's different things that you can kind of look for as managers, depending on where you are in that cycle. So, so and then for yourself, too. I mean, so, so many of us are running you know, very small groups and solo right. shops, and, yeah. and, it, and it doesn't necessarily have to be one of these mass shootings that grabs the headlines, mm -hmm. you know, just every, all of the everyday horrible things. And, you know, mm -hmm. That's a terrible phrase to use, everyday horrible things, but yeah. that's what they are, car accidents and fires, right. and people dying Social and yeah. sexual assaults. Yeah. And, you know, it really does start to wear on you after a while. And you have to take a you know, up breath and take a step back and uh, center yourself again. And it, the reason I know Jeff, and so that because of what was started as the Dark Society became the Alfred Society, and mm -hmm. unfortunately ran out of funding. Mm -hmm. But uh, it was a, a group of journalists who had themselves covered one of these terrible events. Who some six months later, and then you, you guys came back again like a year mm -hmm. later after the, the January eighth shooting in Tucson, and got together a bunch of us who were. Uh, you know, like a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, debriefing over much beer, yeah. and uh, you know, just uh, being there for people is, is very important. And I think for us, that is something that you know, being in such small places. Yeah, and that's but with Lion, I mean, we've got some you know, great connections with people who will be there for you if you, you, know, you, know, you want to vent a little bit or whatever. And uh, there are you know, plenty of other people around the country who are willing to do that as well. And that's why I can spend some time with myself in the last time trying to pass that along a little bit, just be supportive of people who are dealing with that right now. Or, yeah, yeah, and that, that's, uh, I'll just add this one thing, which is that that's a really good point. And the Ockberg Society for Trauma Journalism isn't, isn't formally around so much, but people who have done that work really are still committed. And I think a central commitment of folks who do this kind of reporting is really what Dylan's talking about, is kind of shifting the attitude toward talking about that impact that doing that kind of coverage can have. And that I think that's sadly been kind of a standard element of a lot of journalism cultures. You can only play, you know, a hard-bitten tough guy for so That's right. And that's, you know, when you start keeping the bottle dry, 
Yeah, of course. That's right. And, and to me, what's really exciting about volume of doing that is exactly like you said, a lot of you guys really are in pretty small shops. And there's a lot of other pressures accruing anyway. And then you put in covering pretty traumatic issues that, that can get a bit overwhelming. So kind of changing and opening the space where people just feel comfortable talking about some of the challenges that that kind of work can provide and then thinking about how to engage in those conversations. It's really exciting that you're working together to kind of make that part of the culture. Two things. One is, uh, you mentioned there's people in line who can be a resource. Um, I'm one of those people. I uh, spent too much of my life covering Sandy Hook shooting. Half the people can't see you. <laughs> um, and went through all the stuff that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Um, so that, but that's an aside. My question is, one of the things I've heard in nine months or so in Lion over and over again is, and noticed, is that a huge percentage of our publishers never take a vacation, period. Or they take a vacation and they're hosting stuff all the time. And so that is bad enough, but then you deal with stress like that, you're dealing with stress of whether you can keep the doors open, mm -hmm. and you're covering stuff that's worth the stuff that we kind of like we're, you said the tough guy yeah. about, but weighs on you. So David mentioned he made a point to take a vacation. I, I just want someone to make that point. <laughs> like, how do you do it? How do you do it? How do you do it? I how, 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 what, what, how do you say? Do? Because I couldn't, when I was working for Gannett, I couldn't even take a vacation. I had two weeks of vacation in my last five, six years of working for them. Everything else was, you know. If you're working for a big company like that, you say, I get vacation, I'm taking it. I mean, I don't know. The whole thing I don't know what else to say. But, mm -hmm. but when it's your own company, I mean, I, I get it that we all want to just make sure we keep doing the best job. The secret is that it's going to go on without you, or it's or, or the readers are going to get yeah. a few days off from getting your stuff. Yeah. And it's something you have to internalize. But I just want to say that this is part of thinking about what you do as a business. And in a business, people get vacation have to structure your business that way. Now, whether it's deciding that you can take a few days off and not post, which is hard for all of us, or making sure you have a person who can come in and fill in for you while you're gone, whatever it takes, you've got to do that. I mean, and for some people, the answer might be the former, and for some, it's going to be the latter. But I mean, I would say, build your business to a point where you can take time off and there's people that can run it without you, because then you can do it whenever you want. I mean, you know. I will, I will take a lazy Sunday. You know, here and there, and maybe like pop up one or two things, or maybe if there's no freaking news on Sunday, then you know, well, take, yeah. take weekends but, off. I yeah. mean, tell yourself that. I mean, but if something happens over I'm, the last I'm couple of years, on it, you know? I, I actually I, I will say, and I'm not the only person here in this group this weekend who has had this issue. But I was in counseling with a marriage counselor a couple of years ago because of my job and my wife's job, and. Um, you know, if you haven't already figured it out by the time you get to that stage, you figure out that you've got to bring the marriage or your relationship back up to a level where it gets equal treatment at least, mm -hmm. if not larger treatment than your job does. Uh, and, on and, that note, a lot of us are in the situation I'm in. You know, my wife and I spend all day in a small room posting and, uh, you know, uh, screaming at each other about the proper tone of the headline. <laughs> and I also will say that I try to incorporate relaxation into the job. So, I mean, we have the best jobs in the world because we can work at our own pace. Often it's too fast, but we can take a break if we want. Um, I mean, my coworkers and I go out and drink sometimes, including at lunchtime. I mean, and sometimes you just hit a day and it's a beautiful fall day. There's nothing happening. Let's go do that. And everybody has their own way of relieving stress. Maybe it's going and doing a workout or something. but. You know, you've got to remember to take those for yourself, and it's got to be part of your business. It can't be the thing that's last on the list. Out, out of everybody in here, what was, how, how, how many of, you know, within the past year had, say, three or four consecutive days off? How did you find days off? <laughs> <laughs> well, so, I guess I should be... Because, you know, two days doesn't really count. I might be a little bit like of the yes, object lesson of what happens to well, you when nice. you don't do this. Because, of course, as many of you know, I was diagnosed with cancer last year. And so I ended up having to have abdominal surgery. 
And well, actually, let me backtrack. I was diagnosed with cancer, and then the guy who runs the website with me a month later, he was diagnosed with cancer. So we had no backup plan. Like it was him and me, and we were both kind of like. And I, you know, it, I, I got, I found someone. He's my copy editor, and he does a lot of our reporting too. And um, but he's like his first thing every morning is he gets up and he checks the site and makes sure it all looks good. And so what I did was I found I found a freelance copy editor to step in in case we needed it. And when I told him that, he was like, "Don't take this away from me, right?" And so we ended. And I called her, and she and I had a long conversation. I said, "Look, you're going to be our backup." I don't, you know, I don't want to use you if I don't need to. We're going to try and make this go on our own. But, it, you know, she totally got it. She was great. Like when you, so one of the things I learned was like talking about this stuff is really helpful because if you say to people, look, this is my situation, people kind of step up. So that was the first thing. Like folks kind of stepped in. They asked what they needed. And then last year, um, on a Monday, I sat down and I just was like, okay, this is the way it's going to be. And I scheduled two weeks of <coughs> greatest hits, like stories that we've done that have really good traffic or really featurey things or evergreeny, and I just ran them again. And I pre-programmed the site for two weeks, and then the next day I went into the hospital and had abdominal surgery. <laughs> and, like, didn't touch the website for, you know, two weeks until I came back and then did stuff, and while I was gone, you know, some of the freelancers that we worked for had reported stories, and so I was able to edit them um, when I was still kind of not 100, so not 100 percent. But that, that, that said, that was the only vacation I had last year. Um, so when I just, I'm here with my, with my new development person, and when I brought her on this summer, I said to her, my goal Hiring you is to take a two-week vacation. I'm still not sure how I'm going to do it, yeah. but you you got to do it, man. So the people at Berkeley site were talking about um, membership programs, which is the thing next door, right? Um, recently, and they said that one of the ways they gain support for memberships is to be more transparent about what goes into their work. So uh, New Haven Independent in Connecticut doesn't publish two days a week, and they say very clearly they sign up on Friday, say it's our weekend. We're human beings, yep. and these are the two people who run the site, and we're, you know, or we're going to take this week off, and we'll be back next week. We're going to Bermuda, or we're going where, <coughs> you know, and I and I wonder if that might help more than it hurts. Well, my, my readers know that we, yeah. you will just, it's never been, we literally never do anything on Saturday, full stop. I, mm -hmm. I'm working with students from the journalism school at, at UNC. Um, I went up there, I'm talking to the J school students on the first day. Of class because I got this group of 14 students who are like running around doing stories and they're giving us the content which is great for me and I said to them oh by the way if you want to find me on a Saturday if you email me or call me on a Saturday I'm not going to respond and their teacher just looked at me and said that's what you guys need to learn right now that, you I, have think, to. I think one of the keys is what David said about building your, your business to the point where you can do that where you can a, a comfort level, and I'm happy to say that uh, I think I'm getting there. Uh, two years ago, I left this conference, and, and as I was sitting in the airport to go home, I, made, I, I resolved to get back to the original model of Ray Bank Green, which was uh, a one one person news bureau. I, I tried working with stringers, I just don't work well with stringers, or I have why not bad luck. Well, I, I don't know, I, I can say that there was one. Uh, exception uh, that that I think uh, validates that it's not all. <laughs> uh, I, 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 got, I took this kid who walked in, literally came off a, a, a Navy submarine after five years, didn't even have a high school degree, but had a lot of passion. And uh, I helped, I, I, I think, mold him into a journalist, and he's now covering Chris Christie for uh, the second biggest uh, newspaper in New Jersey. But, um, I, I, I decided to go back to this original model, and part of it was saying, fuck it. Part of it was saying, um, I need to have my own life. You know, I can't allow this to erode my marriage. I can't allow this to, uh, uh, to be uh, pouring pure stress into my system all day long. Um, 
and the recognition, one, that you know, if something happens, as is happening at this very moment in my market, there is a, a hurricane, uh, or the, the one edge of a hurricane uh, battering one of my towns. Um, I kind of have to let go and say, if it happens, people are going to get their news somewhere. They're, they're going to find out about it. Um, they, they may not get Red Bank Green coverage, which they like to have, yeah. but they'll get it. It will covered. be covered. It will yeah. be covered. It's not a story that's exclusive to your abilities to... Uh, but the other part of it is, is realizing that people do love what you do, and they will come back. It's, they're not going to come back. You know, if, you're, if, you're, if you're a new site, a young site, you've only been around for a year, they might come two, two or three times, and if the site hasn't been updated, they think you lost your password. But, um, <clears throat> but if you've been around for nine years, You'll still get tr a lot of pretty good traffic on those days, even when you're you're, you're posting reruns, yeah. greatest hits. So um, it's 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 part of it's it's getting over that hurdle of acceptance. At least it was in my case. Well, this good. is the support group, right? I'm a journalist. And yeah. yeah, I can't yeah. stop it. And, yeah. uh, <laughs> and so I, I need to be. Well, here. you're joking, but I mean that's why I'm no, here. I mean, this is the only reason I come here is to be with these people. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so glad you have. <laughs> well, well, a couple of things I just want to add, and this might be something to think about organizationally for Lion, is that there are uh, organizations that specifically work with fledgling for-profit entities, fledgling non-profit entities like SCORE, the retired executives. So that might be something to um, think about. The investigative news network, you know, it's a lot, I'm sure there's some overlap. Uh, but I, I really thought that the point that you were, uh, you guys were making about just putting out there in the newsroom that talking about how things are going is actually very healthy. And I actually wanted to compliment you on the fact that your reporter felt comfortable disclosing what had happened to her, even though learning that information was very upsetting. And it sounded like also that you created an environment when what could have been ultimately a very disruptive discovery, which was, you know, somebody's been embezzling for us that we've trusted for a year and a half, led to people rallying together. And that actually speaks highly of the, kind of the, the culture that you've been able to create without having seen it. I'm just saying for what you're reporting. And there's a woman, Alana Newman, who's done a lot of work on uh, sexual assault and journalism. So I'd be happy to put you in touch with her in terms of dealing with that employee, because that might be a helpful space to think about from a managing perspective how to deal with that. Um, so anyway, those, those are my thoughts on that. But I, I think it is a really fertile conversation. And I think what, what you guys have created already with Lion augurs well for being able to do more of it. I just feel also that it's really hard because, you know, it's just your small entities. Everybody's trying to keep going and get to that point that John's talking about. Jeff, I think your point about getting together and talking, I mean, that applies to everything that we do. and. In the advertising sessions, you know, mm -hmm. people like Eleanor are telling us, make sure you have a sales meeting and get it straight with those people so they know what the expectations are. And that works in the newsroom, like make sure your news employees or your stringers or whoever it is know what's expected. And maybe that's a meeting, maybe it's drinks. Um, but talking about what we do off deadline is really important. And that's a principle that those of us who worked in corporate newsrooms learned that because that's the way they function. And they have a little more breathing room to do that. In fact, too many meetings. In a but meeting you don't want to have yet. meetings to plan your meetings but, but to we need something. work up a rubric for your meeting schedule to plan But we meetings. need something. We need to talk about how yeah. are we doing on this or whatever. And um, an extension of that is if you are somebody who has employees and that you want to make sure you set clear guidelines for what they need to do. And you know, if, if you haven't had any management training, it might be wor worthwhile to at least read a book or watch a video or talk to somebody who's done it. You know, there's some some basic principles. That's my Zenger Miller training. Anybody ever go through Zenger Miller? Zenger Miller is a, a management training program that was used in a lot of newsrooms in the 80s and 90s. And storming, storming, storming. Exactly. And uh, I actually got to the point where I was a Zenger Miller trainer, so I trained the people that were doing it. I don't worry. But, um, but, the, but the basic things that they did were, you know, looking at how the organization works and then basic principles for dealing with, not only dealing with an employee, but there's a unit in there for how an employee can deal with a boss, managing your boss. I mean, really basic stuff, and it sounds like gobbledygook to somebody who 
is really cynical, like we all are, but there's actually stuff in there that's worthwhile. I think it's really the whole, the meeting thing, and is is a constant source of frustration for some of my reporters. <laughs> like my sports editor, he just has to sit there and listen to everything else that's going on on the city beats, when it really doesn't affect him whatsoever. Mm -hmm. But they need to hear what he's doing, mm -hmm. and they need to be aware of what he's doing, so when they're talking to people, they talk about it intelligently. And you know, we try to we have quarterly staff meetings as well, so that the news team is talking to the sales team, <laughs> and they, I mean, I push them to give each other leads. I just I made a call in this building. There's a new store coming in, you know, store and it, it's this whatever. And then the reporters are at a planning commission meeting, and they hear there's a new store coming in. They probably need advertising, and they go. And we have them work in teams. That Franklin reporter is working with the Franklin sales rep. The Brentwood reporter is working with the Brentwood sales rep, and they have to talk. And I encourage that. But I do think when things go wrong or things go south, and we have a bad sales month, that accountability is not going to be put forth unless it's eye to eye. You didn't do what you were needed to do this month, guys. That's not going to come off in an email. They're just going to get pissed and delete it. Yeah. They got to look you in the eye and know they didn't do their job. And it's the same way with the editorial. What I love about the ed editorial meetings is they're always helping each other quite a bit with story leads. You know, Emily, the Franklin reporter, will hear a story about a cool athlete that Sam doesn't know because Sam's working 60 hours a week covering football right now. You know, and the teamwork there is, is fabulous. I think if you don't have that, you're really missing out. How many are one-person operations? I mean, I'm just wondering, even if you're a one-person operation, you need to get feedback. How do you get feedback? Like, how do you know when you did a good job or well, messed I'm up? Well, I'm out on Broad Street every single day. So, so you're getting it from your readers oh, and yeah, yeah. clients? And, and the, you, of course, we, I think we all experience this when you, when you screw up. They not only will tell you, they will tell all other readers. <laughs> uh, yeah. And that's another, that's another sort, of, sort of stress. I mean, mm -hmm. I, we all make decisions on the fly, and sometimes we make bad decisions mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that we don't want to uh, repeat, but we don't want to try and undo our mistakes, mm -hmm. I think, once they're, they're in print. And, uh, you know, every once in a while you make a really bad one, or, or, or one that, that gives you uh, gives you agita mm -hmm. uh, on a continuing basis. Uh, uh, that, that's there. It's always going to be there. Mm -hmm. it's, how, do you, how do you deal with that? So what, what do you guys want? Or talk about it. get I off your chest. Something um, that relates to a couple of things. How many of you have some sort of plan in place in case you get hit by a bus? The bus factor is always huge. Mm -hmm. Basically, the plan is a complete disaster. Uh -huh. I mean. <laughs> it seems like there should be some sort of like just a checklist, just some sort of you know form spreadsheet that says all the important things that everybody would need to know in an emergency, right? Ideally, you have exist? somebody else. There, who knows? It. It's like in my case, I had one backup, and at one point, I had two backups, which was really nice. Well, the fact is, if something really happened to you, or you decided to move on, the for profit status would not exist anymore, unless they're sold. And some nonprofits wouldn't either. There's a lot of nonprofits that are driven by individuals, and, and, and maybe that's just a fact of life of the, the ecosystem and the that we're in, <laughs> you know? I mean, I spent all of last year trying to get myself out of the business so that, because I was to the point with four sites, if I didn't get out of it, I wasn't going to be able to do anything else. I was personally reached my level of uh, lack of sleep. <laughs> I couldn't go any further and take any more hours away. And so I hired a sales manager, which was a huge step for me, and she's unfortunately the one I had to lay off. But it was, it was really close to being able to live in my normal life. But and, so and that I think so that's giving delegating a whole bunch of not just tasks but actual responsibility to somebody else. And if, if they're actually doing their job and you're checking in on them, yeah. if they're doing their and job, you have that much completely taken off your plate. Well, and that office manager, I mean, obviously I let her have too much control. I mean, I let her take too much off my plate, and she. But I, have, I can't even tell you, very manipulative and. No excuses. I'm still my the buck stops here thing, but she was professional. She had done it before. <laughs> um, 
So that would be my biggest piece of advice, by the way. I was going to start with this, was do background checks with everybody you hire, even if you've known them for 20 years. <laughs> do a background check because um, you need to know what's there. And, um, right, so and, and generally, if there's something there and they're honest people, I've just said to them, you're new. I'm going to run a background check. Is there anything you'd like to tell me in person as opposed to me reading it on background check? Oh, wow. And they always tell me. But I didn't do the background checks until after that girl was gone. So it's just so important. And I think I think I fought the payroll system for a long time, not wanting to hire a payroll company. If I had done that, a lot of things wouldn't have happened. So uh, I recommend that as well. ADP is a big break. I mentioned this when I was talking earlier, but I, I had an employee handbook developed with a lawyer. And would, I would you mind sharing that? I would. Let me just it's a really say this. Good process to go through. Um, it, it, would, it took about six weeks working with a lawyer, and we kind of talked about what, it, why were we doing it, what do we need it for, um, what were the issues we were concerned about, and she started with one that she had developed for somebody else, and we customized it for ours. But I mean, um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't advise anybody to take yours and run with it. They would need to read it and no, know it, and have to conform with, you know. Yeah, and, I, and the one thing that I learned is you can't actually just download one from somewhere because state laws are yep, different. Exactly. And, but the general concepts can yeah, be the same. But the, but it'll at least give you an idea of what should be in there. But um, it's actually most of it's basic stuff. Like, I mean, you want to have written down somewhere how many days of vacation you get because you might get an employee for whom it becomes an issue. And that was one of the reasons we did it, is one of my employees, I just needed to be written down what the expectations were for the number of days that she worked. And you know, and you want to make sure that people understand what they're getting into, and you don't want to you know, create it, even just the appearance of people being treated unfairly and differently. You know, if it's there and written, written down, this is had, how, how it is. And in journalism, there are some things that you need to address that you're not going to address in an accounting firm. If they do something really stupid on social media, you need to talk about what's going to happen when they do. You need to talk about if they're using their own, their own computer because they don't want a, a PC, they want to use a Mac. What happens when something happens to the computer? You are not responsible for it. It needs to be stated in the employee handbook, and they need to sign it. We had that happen. You and want to address things like Technology use is definitely one of them. Social media, um, the data and information that your salespeople collect. Who owns that? You know, you. I mean, this is really tough because salespeople do this all the time. They take their book with them, but you want to have some control over it. Um, we didn't have in there a non-compete, but some places have a non-compete agreement. Um, really hard to enforce those, I think. But I have want a non-compete, but I've actually taken it out in certain instances when they when that was a, a, a barrier. Because they, it didn't scare me for them to go. I would be happy to share ours. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, a, it's another one of these things. If you could get the lawyer to do it in exchange for an ad, that's better than paying for it. I, I think we paid a few thousand bucks for it. Um, and, I'm not and, I, and I did mine with ADP. I mean, I, well, I had, I had a consultant do the first round with right. me, but after this whole thing, and like, I did, it turns out I didn't have in my employee handbook if you steal from me, you can be fired. Guess what? <laughs> People have actually, you know, had to pay unemployment because of that, not having that in their handbook. So wow. when I hired ADP, I paid the little bit, like fifty dollars extra a month, and I get all of this, these resources. They go through my employee handbook. They tell me what's missing. Um, they apply it to my state laws, and it's in there. And everything goes out electronically, and everybody signs it electronically. So there's a record in ADP that people have signed. You know, and every time I make a change, it goes out to everybody, they sign it, and it goes back in. There are so many Does anybody else things have something that, that they want to raise? We're starting to run up against our time limit, I think. Yes. I wanted to hear that, and I just wanted to get to John. Small item that it relates to my current day job. I don't sell insurance, I help people buy less. But I can't help but hear all of the risk exposures that this industry has. <laughs> and it sounds like you all kind of know it's there, but we don't know what to do about it. That, is that very, very assessment? true. I mean, for example, employment practices liability, okay, it's particularly wage and hour claims, are the fastest growing employee, employee, employer dispute in the, in the country. And uh, I have a, I serve on the board with a lawyer who is, is paralegal the last 22 years, quote, retires, quits. A month later, he gets slapped with a wage and hour lawsuit for all this unpaid overtime that she, that she alleges. He's, he's emotionally 
he's shocked because here's this loyal employee, and I'm like the last person he would expect to, to do this because they left on good terms. Point is, it happens and something's got to be done. Really important point. If you have employees, the new um, president of the new overtime rules okay. apply to you even if you get one employee. It's, there's no like max, there's no right. like, minimum thing. Um, so, <laughs> and those <laughs> rules apply to a lot more people now. Forty thousand dollars or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. um, can't work over forty hours a week without paying overtime. You can't make a salary position. You know they can't be considered a manager if they're making less than that. If they're making over that and they're not doing management type stuff, you have an issue too. Else? I just wanted to uh, talk to the point that John raised about the strain of worrying about inaccuracy, um, and I understand that. Uh, I do a, a lot of investigative projects, so I did a big one last year. I, I think we, we were talking a little bit about it. Before, it was kind of a year-long project, pretty much, the Center for Public Integrity. So just in general, but especially before that came out, I, it, it's a very intense feeling of concern. So I definitely understand that. I think it sounds like you're in a more of a daily context, yeah. and it sounds like from what I understand that you have a pretty good level of engagement with your readers and a pretty good level of trust. Yeah. And I think that the trust that accrues if you're able to stick around over time is not based on being perfect, but it's, be, it's based on being as open and accurate as possible. And so on those times when you know, you make, you make a mistake, it's, you know, kind of bucking up, hey, I did this, and then moving forward, trying to learn and think about, hey, how can I avoid doing this? I don't think that completely mitigates being worried about doing it, but I think if it, if, if we can, I, I feel that's something that we can think about shifting from this idea that, especially in a, in a daily context, that we'll just operate in a perfect fashion and there will never be mistakes, and so what we do is so terrible. Not that it's not, I'm not saying it is a good thing. I'm just saying that shifting from acting like, well, when that happens, then it's horrible, or it is bad, you address it and move forward. I think that actually can increase trust, provided that it, it you know, it doesn't happen like five times a day. Then it's just like, <laughs> okay, you know, but I don't think that's the case. But I, but I know that fear of that. that fear it all that. happens in one day sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Right. But I, I just I just wanted to share that thought on that point that you raised because you asked a question on it. Yeah. We make a point of if we you know correct something besides a minor typo, we put a correction note on that story. You know, yeah, we 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 screwed it up. Okay, there's the correction. Sorry. And I think you know people uh, respect that. I think that's important. It's not you know I don't want to try and hide the fact that we. If, if, it's, if, it's, if it's significant it's enough, I, I would post it on social media saying, you know, this story from eight weeks ago has been corrected or yeah. clarified. Yeah, if, if, you, if you really, you know, yeah. screw the pooch on it, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you know, just, you want to tell people then to actually, you know, get them informed. Yeah. And, and I think that does create a, a bit more trust. And we have the ability, you know, online to put that correction right there with that story and not just, you know, hide it on page eight and, you know, tiny type as, a, you know, mm -hmm. in the days of yore. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We also talk to the fact about, you know, building that trust with people and making them understand what you're actually doing every day and why mm -hmm. it's worth what you want from them to this, right? Like, you deserve a vacation. You, you know, going to make a mistake you're one guy and it, it helps make people understand exactly what they're doing every day because a lot of times I think they'll forget right and expect the same thing that you're expecting from yourself right hey can you crowdfund the vacation <laughs> <laughs> that's the other workshop <laughs> yeah <laughs> I, I would love to get an opinion on something I've been considering. Yeah. So, in order to make my business more sustainable, I'd love to get to the point where I have two employees doing editorial on the site so that one can take a vacation and you know, the site still lives without yeah. all sorts of running around and hollering. Um, but what I've also been thinking about if we have two employees, what about extending out the day? So, day parting the shifts. So that, so that when they are both there, you are, yeah. 
so that you have one employee, you know, starting work at say 6 a.m. and the other ending work at 10 p.m. And so that old question of okay, who's going to get the short straw and go cover the meeting at night is answered. Um, yeah. And then, but then what what happens when somebody's on vacation? Do you just mid shift and uh, figure it out? Yeah. Um, move it around is necessary to hit those but meetings. I, but I'm wondering if anybody has done that um, in terms of yeah day parting shifts. And also the other thing I'm considering is making one of the shifts 10 hours a day, but um, with Friday off since I don't want anybody working Friday night. Has anybody had any experience with that? We have with editors. We have um, two part-time editors. And one works during the day and one works the nights. Mm -hmm. So the reporters, we work with them to try to make sure that they don't come in till noon if they're going to be working till 8 or whatever because we cover a lot of meetings. And um, But it was just impossible to have somebody full-time in the office during the day and still ask them to cover the night meetings. Right. So it worked, we found a really fabulous former reporter um, who worked under my now editor at the Tennessean. And so she, she has a full-time job but misses the news because she's doing marketing for a private school. And so she's having fun editing at night, and um, she, she comes on about 9 o'clock. We all do it by, through Google Chat, so we're all back and forth. She can ask the reporters questions, and I'm there to help if whatever, you know, if needed. And that way Mark works during the day and has his nights off, and my editor's not wiped out, exhausted, which my former partner was. And so I'm trying to address the problems we've had in the past on that. But I would think that the day shift split with reporters would be fabulous. It wouldn't work for me because we have, they all have their own beat. But when we were down, the school's reporter, they were, you know, they all helped jump in and cover school board meetings and things that would have been uncovered at that point. And we just tried to give them extra time off, you know, during the day because they were doing those extra night meetings. I think that's really smart. Yeah, I think it's, um, I was just going to say, I think it's a good approach. The other thing, I, um, a pointer now, but I used to work in CNN, so I had to manage a team of six people and make sure we were staffed 24-7, so a mm -hmm. constant day party was huge, um, yeah. but also rotating the shifts so you people don't get the short stick and aren't always right. on the night shift, so that helped a lot too, and um, since it was kind of shared among the team, everybody understood that sometime you were going to get the crappy schedule, but it wouldn't be forever. Uh, when I used to work at OI, which was the Chicago Tribune Spanish language newspaper, so it was a pretty small outfit, about a dozen people within, you know, much larger entity. Uh, and, the, and the work week was Sunday through Thursday, just because of the publication schedule. And then there was one person who didn't work as much on Thursday, and then was kind of watching the site on weekends in case news broke. So did that kind of stuff. But I think uh, I think to the point that you just made about kind of rotating who does that, that can kind of keep morale. Uh, more equitable, you know, a sense of more equity there. But yeah, no, it's, it's creative. I, do you have enough going on at 6 a.m. to bring somebody in then, or would that person just be you know, spinning up the site for the morning? And then? Yeah, it would sort of, I, I, as envisioned, it would be sort of spinning up the site in the morning. It would also give Get us the social the, media rolling for when people wake up. The and, ability to publish breaking news uh, when it happens more, so, more often without, you know, me having to leave my dinner to get cold and have yeah. my house. Yeah, I, I mean, I think back, it, I mean, part of it is expanding coverage, and the other part is preventing employee burnout. Um, you know, I think back, I probably wouldn't have started my site if it wasn't for the fact that the TV station I was working for put me on the graveyard shift. So, you know, to work with my evening grad school school, which was not a good situation. Um, so, yeah, I, I think I have to sort of have those two goals that I'm trying to meet. Are we doing we should, we're past time. Okay. So we have right. um, and have a non-coffee because non-coffee after coffee break. Yeah, we will have a non-coffee <laughs> break. Put in the have some water. It's good so. for you. <laughs> and then we're going to have a ten minutes. We'll ten minutes in the other the other round of breakouts. Thank you guys very Thank much. You.